and welcome to The Curiosity Show, the show that widens your knowledge of the world around you. I'm Lara. And I'm Megan. And today it's day five of the Nottingham Festival of Science and Curiosity. The festival's a whole week celebrating all things sciencey, and we're here to show you some of the weird and wonderful things that are happening in the world around us. Plus, there are lots of events from launching your own rockets to exploring the garden of Just Because to setting off on an adventure into intergalactic universe. Head over to our website to book your tickets. And it's also the final Curiosity Show of the week. I can't believe it's gone so fast, but I think we're going to go out on a bang because we've got even more bits of curiosity in today's show. We're going to visit Joni's garden, learn all about ants, and we'll catch up with Rick to see how strong an eggshell really is. There's so much to come. But first, let's head over to the University of Nottingham to meet Frankie, the electric racing car. We are the University of Nottingham racing team. We're engineering students, and we design and make electric racing cars. Here's the story of Frankie, our 2021 car. First up, why electric cars? Electric cars are super important for the future of transport. No harmful exhaust fumes, and electricity to power them can be generated from renewable sources. This makes them much better for the environment. Back to Frankie. So, what does it actually take to build an electric racing car? What were the first steps in designing Frankie? So the first steps are you've got to set out some requirements that you definitely want to hit and then it's sort of starting to think about how how you're going to hit those requirements and making sure you've got the right people working on the right bits and delegating tasks properly because as well as all the actual design side of it you have to have it set up well in terms of you know, management groups of people doing different things so that's probably the first steps of the whole design process. All of the parts in the car need to be either designed and manufactured by our team members or chosen from ready-made options. Our creative engineers make most of the parts in-house, from the chassis to the battery. What were your favourite moments during the design and build? Uh, I'd say the just spending time in the workshop uh, was just a good feeling. It felt quite um, like I was achieving something to build the car and see it come, come alive, come together. But often, things don't work out properly the first time around. And so our team need to become detectives, figuring out what's gone wrong and where, and then how to fix it. What were the most challenging moments during the design and build? I think some of the most challenging bits were when, when there were sort of setbacks where there was at one point where we tried to turn the wheel and the gearbox was jamming and we were all really tired and, you know, just little setbacks that then you have to fix, but everything was fixable, it's just when you get really tired. But that was probably, you know, the most challenging bits. It's the lack of sleep and you've still got to get stuff done, but it's worth it in the end. <laughs> what is your key learning experience with your time, in your time with the team? I think one of the biggest things that former student has taught me is um, the process that can work through as a team, working in the groups that we have, um, and just the ability that gives you to problem solve and um, just really how to effectively work with some other fantastic people to uh, come up with solutions we need. This whole process of designing, making improvements and then building takes almost a year and a half. Thanks to the team's hard work, we now have our car, Frankie. And next, it's time to race. We compete against other universities from across the world in the Formula Student UK event, which takes place at Silverstone Racetrack every July. Before being allowed to drive on a track, cars get tested in a number of different areas to prove that they meet the rules and are safe to drive. This is called scrutineering. 2021 marked a huge milestone for the team, as Frankie was our team's first car to fully pass scrutineering. Best memory from the whole experience? Seeing the car pass scrutineering finally. Um, our faculty advisor, Chris, he, he put the final sticker on and that was a very special moment. I'm going to remember that one for a 
Then comes the fun of driving the car on the track. At Silverstone, we do a one lap sprint around the track for the fastest time. What was your favourite moment or moments during the competition? So, favourite moment, definitely getting to drive the car in the testing area. Uh, being in the seat and whizzing around some cones, just, it felt good to see it alive and feel it alive. Following this is the endurance competition, which is 26 laps long. Frankie was the only electric car to successfully finish the endurance competition. This highlights a challenge for electric cars, which still need to stop to recharge more frequently than petrol or diesel cars. In fact, Frankie did so well that our team came third overall, and we were the best electric vehicle too. I was extremely happy, surprised. Uh... Elated, there was a lot of emotions. Tired was made probably the biggest one. Very tired, but very happy. What were your thoughts and feelings when you found out that the team was best EV and third overall? Uh, that was pretty amazing. Uh, it felt like the combination of a few years' work came together, and to finish uni in such a way was was really good. It was really amazing. What a year for the University of Nottingham racing team. Check out our social media to follow our journey this year. Doesn't that just go to show how science and research is around us every day, even in sports? Now, we love nature and growing all things green on this show. So let's head over to Joni's garden now. The sun's been out today, so I'm sure it's going to look lovely. So what's inspired your garden then? Um, nature. I love frogs. I've been obsessed with frogs since I was tiny i love them when i moved here i used to live three doors down and we had a small pond and it filled up with frogs and i was like ah so when we move into a house that we bought i wanted a pond so i've got three now what was your garden like when you bought the house and how different is it now oh it was awful when we bought it it was um the people that lived here had had a dog and I think they just let it dig big holes in the garden. So the green roof, we really wanted a green roof because it just looks beautiful and it every little bit helps, doesn't it really? <laughs> They're mostly sedums and alpine plants up there. What's it like having a garden like this and how you've transformed it? What's it offer you? It's really peaceful. It's beautiful in my shed. You can sit in there, I've got a couple of bird books in there, my binoculars, and you sit in there, we've got a sofa in there and a desk, and sit there and watch the birds on the bird feeder. Goldfinches, blue tits, great tits, robins, um, blackbirds, coloured doves, um, wood pigeons. The sunflowers are great because they bring the birds as well, so I get to keep the heads and put them up for the birds. So sunflowers are great for everybody. They look beautiful and they feed my birds. The hedgehogs are the things that make me the most happy. But hedgehogs and foxes, a lot of people yeah. actually probably wouldn't know that there's wildlife like that here. Yeah. Yeah, you've got to draw some holes in you. Yeah, sense. I've got one in my gate. So the hedgehogs do, I've got footage of them coming through there. So there's a hole in my gate which they can get through. There's a good space at the back where all the um, stumps and things are all piled up at the back. There's plenty of holes in that fence, so they can, at the garden behind me, they can get through. Thanks Wild NG for that video. I really like that green roof garden shed as well. I might have to steal that idea for my garden. 
Right, challenge time now as it's time for our final Guess That Sound! <laughs> and we've got another fantastic one for you today. Let's see if you can guess what animal this is. <laughs> and let's hear that one more time. Do you know what animal that sound is? Find out after the break. The I've been a UNICEF ambassador for 18 years and I've been sent to some extreme humanitarian emergencies from the Congo to Afghanistan. Believe me, the people suffering the most in all of them were the children. Today, the war in Yemen is putting over 12 million children in danger. Many children are so sick and malnourished that without food, water and basic health care, they could die. So we ask, what can we do? We have to do something. One thing we could do is search UNICEF Yemen online or text HELP to 83080 to find out how you can help. Just five pounds could help provide life-saving food to feed a child for a week. I have seen UNICEF's work for myself in extreme emergencies. It saves lives and it saves childhoods. We must act now. I'm pleading with you to give from your hearts. Search UNICEF Yemen online or text HELP to 83080 and help save a child's life today. With Post Office Over 50's Life Cover, you can have the time of your life. Safe in the knowledge will pay out money when your time is up. UK resident, 50 to 80, your guaranteed acceptance. No health checks and from just £1.15 a week. Plus, you'll even get to choose a £100 gift card. Call Post Office now on 0800 171 2211. Welcome back to the Curiosity Show. Now, before the break, we asked you to guess what animal makes this sound. <laughs> now, when I first heard it, I thought it was a sheep. Did any of you at home guess a sheep? Shall we hear it one more time? <laughs> well, if you did guess sheep, you were quite close, but it's actually a goat. Well done if you did get that at home. Now don't forget if you see anything on today's show that you want to get involved with or want to see any events for the festival then go to our website www.notsfosac.co.uk. Now it's time to meet today's scientist. As you've seen we've spoken to lots of scientists throughout the week so we can find out what it's like to do their job and what they learn about on a day-to-day -day basis. Today we're talking to Sarah Goodacre. You might remember yesterday we went to University of Nottingham to meet their creepy crawlies in the spider's lab. And today we're going to talk to Sarah about her research into spider and spider's webs. Take a look at this. I became a scientist because I'm fascinated in how the natural world works. I always have been. And I wanted to have a job where I could study that every day. The minute I'm researching spiders and spider silk, how we can use it for use in engineering or medical technology, but also I'm researching hidden passengers on the spiders, so that's hidden microbes, bacteria and fungi that you can't see with the naked eye, but that we can show are there, and they make a real difference to what the spider does. My average day is really varied, so I'm sometimes in the lab, sometimes I'm out in the field collecting spiders, quite a lot of time I'm reading. My PhD was probably one of the things that was the hardest I've ever done, was the most fun I've ever done, was the most tiring I've ever done, and it's something that I'm the most proud of ever having done. I love, in my job, many aspects of it. I love working with people. That's probably the thing I like the most. I'm not sure if I have a favourite scientist, but what I do think is those people who set up new study systems to look at the way the world works are probably the ones I admire the most. 
One interesting fact related to my research is about spider silk and the proteins that make it up. They're very similar in some ways, despite the fact that silks they actually make look rather different. Do what you love and enjoy finding out things that you think you could never dream of being part of. Enjoy it. Follow what you love. That would be my best advice. Thanks, Sarah. So great to hear about all of the work that she's been doing at the Spider Lab. And again, you know, a huge thank you to all of the scientists that we've had on the show so far this week. We've just still got one more for you, though, after the break. Next up, we've got another one of our sustainable chemistry videos. And today we'll be looking at the materials that we can get from plants. Different materials and chemicals can be extracted from plants to help us make things. There's even a special process that can help turn plant waste into plastics. Take a look. Hi, I'm a researcher at the University of Nottingham looking at the sustainable manufacture of chemicals. In this video, we'll look at how light, a coloured solution and the air around us can be used to turn plant waste into plastics. Currently, many of our industrial processes rely on fossil fuels. The use of fossil fuels and their derivatives isn't sustainable as it takes millions of years to regenerate the amount we use in just a week. The processing and combustion of fossil fuels is a primary contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, which is one of the leading causes of climate change. The manufacturing of plastics is an example of one of these industries. We can take inspiration from nature to manufacture the chemicals we need in a more sustainable manner. Firstly, plants are made of polymers, and it's possible to take plant waste, known as biomass, and break it down into monomers, which we can then use light, air, and some dye to convert into a more valuable monomer, which can more readily be converted into the types of plastics that we need. Secondly, the cells of a plant are host to photochemical processes which convert water and carbon dioxide into sugar and oxygen using sunlight. We can take inspiration from this to manufacture chemicals with minimal use of harsh compounds or high energy operating conditions the use of biomass derived material for chemical transformations is an active area of research within sustainable chemistry. So what does this mean? Manufacturing with light is essentially another form of transferring energy to be used for a chemical reaction. The coloured solution can absorb light and use it to generate a more reactive form of oxygen. This can then react with the monomers derived uh, from plant materials to create more useful monomers that can be made into the plastics that we need. So how can we adopt these principles in the lab? In the lab, the apparatus needed for conducting these experiments can be very simple, but there's a strong drive to develop advanced photochemical reactors that can meet the demands of our chemical industry in a sustainable manner. So I hope you've learned something new about making plastics sustainably, but that's only half of the problem. While creating plastics from plant waste could go some way to reduce our dependency on fossil fuels, what happens to these plastics when they're no longer needed? How do we get rid of them? Watch the next video to find out more about the chemical and biological recycling of plastics. Wasn't that amazing? I've learned so much from those uh, sustainable chemists over the week and I hope you have too. Now if you remember yesterday we met Mike and Johnny from Box Lab and today Mike is back. What are you going to be showing us? Oh, today we're going to be making some instant cola, uh, some bubble snakes and I'm going to make something disappear. So as you guys are breaking up for the half term and we all enjoy a drink over the half term uh, how about we can make some instant cola? I'm going to show you exactly what to do. Um, in this bottle here, we have some iodide ions, and we're going to reduce... We're going to remove the electrons from those iodide ions, and when I add my second chemical... We get some instant cola. There you go. Just for those of you that missed it, I'm going to do it again. So just remember, what we've got in here is some 
uh, a solution of iodide ions. We're going to oxidize them into iodine. And the reason it turns like a blue or black color, uh, we have a starch solution. The starch binds to the iodide, iodine and turns blue or black. Wow. Oh my God. Instant cola. <laughs> <laughs> so the next one. Here's an idea for the half term. And it's a really simple experiment that you guys can do at home. Uh, you can take a bottle, and I've just cut the neck off the bottle. And I've just got one of these microfiber cloths, and I'm going to attach it to the end of the bottle like that. So I've still got the, the mouth of the bottle, but I've just put the microfiber fi um, cloth at the end. And we're going to secure it in place with an elastic band. Just make sure it's nice and secure. And you are going to need to make yourself a bubbly solution. Now this solution here is one part washing up liquid and two parts water. And you're just gonna dip the end of your bottle into that solution. Make sure it's saturated and then magic happens <laughs> see how big you can get your bubble snake great fun to do during the half term and for my last experiment <laughs> how cool would it be to make something disappear we're going to use physics to make my glass beaker completely disappear now it's not really disappearing we're just using the laws of refraction uh, the glass beaker and the oil that i'm going to pour into it they have the same refractive index that just means that they both uh, slow down the speed of light at the same rate and it makes this smaller beaker inside appear invisible. Amazing. Just imagine all the fun we could have making things disappear. And look, the beak, just to prove to you this isn't a camera trick, the beaker is still there. It's just that the beaker and the oil have the same refractive index. So there's some quick physics for you guys. Wow, that was amazing! I definitely want to have a go trying that snake later, don't yeah, you? Yeah, same. I can't believe it disappeared. I wasn't expecting that to happen. <laughs> Still to come, anyway, on the show today, we're going to meet a forensic psychologist. We're going to be going through our curiosity board because we've learned so much through the week. We're going to have a look at how strong eggs are. And you're going to be back, aren't you, definitely. in a bit to show us a massive demonstration, I'm told. Now, I don't know what they're going to be doing. Um, but I feel like everyone's laughing at me because you do. Don't uh, you? We know what's going on, but <laughs> Laura, you're, you're in the dark on this one. So we, her reaction is going to be live on air. Remember that the Curiosity Show is just a very small part of our wider festival, the Festival of Science and Curiosity, that started on Monday and we're running all through into next week. So um, we've got lots and lots of events and activities, lots of, lots of things that you can drop into, but lots more that you need to book onto. So really, um, it, what, you, what you need to be doing is getting over to our festival website, www.notsfosac.co.uk. And, and half term is coming up, so you don't have an excuse to not be trying out that bubble snake. Send <laughs> us your videos and your pictures on our social media at KnottsFosac using the hashtag CuriousKnots so that Megan and I can see what you've been up to. It's time for a short break now, but after the, afterwards I'm going to be joined with Pally in the studio who's going to talk to us all about what it's like to be a forensic psychologist. Don't go anywhere. The
Hello, I'm Will Watson, Director of Watson's Estate Agents, and this is Francesca, Angelina, John and Laura. We're going to be giving you our top five tips for selling your home. <music> Tip one, get your ducks in a row. Uh, start by having a look online, get in a feel for what's out there in the market. Uh, a lot of properties are selling before they even get online, so I would advise you to register with a good local estate agent to get advance notice on uh, some of these properties that are, are going to be coming onto the market, get a good flavour for it. Then ask them out to do evaluation on your own property, and that's going to give you a good feel on uh, what your budget might be going forward. And also that a good, reliable local estate agent will have access to a good um, independent mortgage advisor, and they will also uh, give you a good sense of your affordability. Tip number two is choose the right estate agent. So it's really important you get this right, have a look around the area and online, see who's selling the most properties in your area, and they'll be the agent that will normally have the most buyers on their database. So that's a really good place to start from because you can get viewings even before you get yours online. Um, also think about are they on social media using that, it's a really good tool. Are they on all the major web portals? And when are they available to speak to my buyers? Okay, top tip number three is prepare your property. Curb appeal is really important for a first impression to a buyer. So little things like take the car off the driveway to show the space. If there is any clutter, you can see a bit of garden waste there, just put it away in the bin and, and certainly keep the bin out of view as best you can. So come inside, there'll be some more tips. Okay, so another good first impression, quite a light, spacious hallway. Shoes are all out of the way with the shoe cupboard there, so that's good. And as we go through, we've got little Jesse here. Not ideal um, as a distraction when you're trying to show people your home, so uh, try and keep pets out of the way as best you can. So the kitchen's a really important room in the house. It can be very costly if you feel it needs replacing and you can't afford it. There is actually an option that you might not be aware of of just recovering the cupboard doors, and that can be done on a budget. So that's worth thinking about. But this one's really nice, simple, uncluttered, nice smells of coffee or bread in the background is always, it's a cliche, but it's true. Um, but a really important thing is before you think about getting your property on the market, if you are aware of any damp or electrical issues, it's really important you get that sorted first because that's the number one thing that will put buyers off. So my top tip to you would be to work with your estate agents and communicate we're a proactive agent and before your property's hitting the property portal such as Rightmove and Zoopla, we're already mailing it out to thousands of registered buyers that we have on our database. These are your hottest buyers ready to trot. So we need you to communicate, check that your emails aren't going to your junk folder and answer that phone and be flexible with any viewings. My top tips for completing the sale of your home are completing your fixtures and fittings form as quickly as possible. Decide what you're leaving at the earlier stage. Secondly, I would choose a solicitor that has a good working relationship with your estate agent as this is most important in getting the transaction to be as smooth as possible. And lastly, as eager as you are, please do not book your removals until a date is confirmed as until you exchange contracts, their date is not legally binding. I come here regularly actually because the rings are so cheap but the designs are amazing and I buy two or three at a time because you can afford it. They're absolutely stunning, absolutely stunning, amazing. And welcome back to the Curiosity Show, the, cu uh, the, the show that shows you all about the world around you. Now, if you remember, we've had some amazing guests on the show this week, and now I'm joined by Pally, who is a forensic psychologist at Nottingham Trent University. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Thanks Good. for inviting me today. We're very excited to have you. So tell me a little bit about your job. 
Okay, so I'm a forensic psychologist, so what that means, if I start off by talking about what a psychologist is, so a psychologist is someone that understands the brain and understands behaviour, and what a forensic psychologist is, that we try to understand criminal behaviour. So why do people engage in criminal behaviour? What are some of those kind of reasons that they might kind of do that? And what a forensic psychologist does, we understand what those reasons are, so we try to tell the story, really, in terms of why this person in front of us might have kind of done that particular criminal behaviour, and that could be lots of reasons. It could be that, you know, when they were young, they had problems at home, they could have had problems at school, maybe they kind of grew up not having a lot of stuff in their life, lots of kind of, you know, maybe money problems, that kind of stuff. And we link all those things together to develop a picture and understanding of why this person in front of us has kind of done this kind of behaviour. And then once we have that story, that picture, that understanding, we then give them treatment. So the idea is that the treatment will help them to not do it again. So we give them skills. And that could be skills to help them manage their feelings differently. It could be to kind of manage their relationships differently. It could be about problem solving skills. So yeah, so then once we've done that treatment, hopefully it reduces the possibility that they'll do it again. And why, why is it so important, you know, for, for society for you to do that? Yeah, so I guess it's kind of important for lots of reasons. So it's important in terms of keeping everyone safe, and that's the person who's committed the crime, but also everyone else around them. And also I think it's a good thing to do to kind of help the person and try and kind of reduce risk and those kind of things as well. So you work at the university, but before yes. you worked in hospitals. I what did. does kind of a day-to-day -day life look like for you? Yeah, okay, so in my hospital role, um, I would be... Um, associated or be linked to a ward and I would be the forensic psychologist for that ward and then I'd have my kind of we call them patients or service users or clients whichever kind of term people prefer and we would have our clients on the ward and we would understand in the way I've just described we would do that assessment and then we'd kind of do treatment but also we'd kind of do these things called risk assessments to try and understand if their risk has changed as well and what kind of things we need to do to try and help them as well um, so that was the kind of what we call the ward psychologist role. Okay, so where else might you find kind of forensic psychology in hospitals? Yeah, prisons. Else? So yeah. we have um, lots of forensic psychologists that work in prisons and do kind of programs there. And um, we have some forensic psychologists. Um, we call them expert witnesses. So they go to court and they give evidence in a court setting in terms of helping the judge or the individuals involved in the case to understand what that person's risk might be and where they should probably end up in terms of supporting them. And also, of course, in a university setting, which is where I work now. Okay. Um, and now I've gone on the other side, so I now teach and develop forensic psychologists to kind of go out there and work in the field as well. So I kind of got both perspectives. And what's your favourite thing about that? What's the most rewarding thing about that? Okay, so when I was working in a hospital um, setting, the most rewarding thing was when I'd work with someone and I'd really got that feeling that I really helped them yeah. and they'd kind of give me the feedback that I helped them. So that was really rewarding because I came into the job to make a difference. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a challenging job. So I think kind of that feeling of I've actually really helped this person, I've made a difference in this person's life is really important. And then in the university setting now, it's a similar thing. So when I kind of talk to students and talk about the job, um, hopefully I inspire them to want to go and train to be a forensic psychologist hopefully I don't scare them off um, <laughs> but you know really that kind of sharing of that kind of knowledge and that feeling when the students really kind of connect and feel really inspired and motivated it just makes me feel really good inside and there's highs and lows in every job just quickly what do you think the hardest part about your job is so I think the hardest part is that obviously you're working with situations that can be quite tricky and quite risky and dangerous it also takes a really long time to become a forensic psychologist it's a very busy and stressful job as well um, so that can be quite hard yeah. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much for talking to Thank us. Thank you for having me. That was Pally from Nottingham Trent University, who's a forensic psychologist. Now we're going to head over to the Nottingham Biomedical Research Centre, where they've been researching into hearing. Take a look at this. What's that rabble doing in the lab? Kids. Worse still. Teenagers, who let them in? They're here to help direct the research. What? Is that Dr. Marciani? We, we are not the patient, we are not the young person, so it's just wrong for us to tell people what, what, what they should be doing, we should do it together. Because like what the researchers might think is a really important thing might not be as important as something else to the patient. So. But, but, how could they? It's easy. We treat them as equals, Brian. They speak, 
We listen. Actually, much more than that. They also help us create better patient recruitment materials. They make sure I explain what I am doing in a way other young people can understand. We did um, a video to advertise about the magic study. We made two, one with like animated beans and one for like little children to tell them about the trial. They help me understand what their life is like, their perspective. They have ideas about what would help, which I could never think of. I think it's a good idea for young people to share their thoughts because it allows researchers to make improvements if necessary. Improvements as necessary. And they change what we do for the better. And it's pretty good to show like how we, as like, like just a group could make such an impact on the studies. But isn't it, like, really difficult? There are some extra practical problems, yes. Keeping parents in the loop, transport. But the biggest problem is researchers who think they are more important than the young people in the room. Everyone has to be equal to everyone else. I keep meeting short and have fun team building activities. You have to create the right environment for everyone to speak out. Then you get gold. I think especially having the public involved in this, it's just amazing to me. We need more young people to join us. And research needs more researchers to listen to young people. bit more from Carly and Benji who were involved in hearing research. Now, Lara, how much baking do you do at home? I don't do loads. And how are you at cracking eggs? I think, yeah, I back my abilities with cracking eggs, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, here's, now it's time for another one of Rick's demonstrations and he's going to be looking at how strong eggshells actually are. The Fury I was making chocolate brownies last night and I used up quite a few eggs and it reminded me of that saying about not treading on eggshells or being careful if you tread on eggshells and that's because everybody thinks that eggshells are really fragile so I started thinking well I wonder just how fragile eggshells really are and so I got some eggs I got the eggshells and I just trimmed the bottoms like this, so they were nice and straight. And I'm going to put them onto this tea towel, like this, because I want to test just how strong are they. Okay, so, there we are. Look, we've got five eggshells. Now, let's see, I wonder how strong you think they are. Well, I've got some books here. Some of these books are quite big and quite heavy. Hmm. Well, that seems fairly secure. Let's try. What else? We've got another book. Another book. I wonder how many books we can load up on top of the... Look, Inventions That Changed the World. A really big book. <sighs> Do you know what? I've run out of books. How much pressure do you think I could put on those eggshells before they crumble? Well, look, that was one, two, three, four, five, six books, and then I pressed on the top. So that just goes to show that eggshells are really much stronger than we ever think. And that's partly because of what they're made of, but also that amazing dome shape. And that's what gives the eggshells strength. How good was that? I'm a bit disappointed that he didn't bring us any brownies, but I think I was expecting them to hold maybe one or two books, not the whole stack. Now it's time for another challenge before we go to the break. Time for our final microscopic picture from the University of Nottingham School of Life Sciences Imaging Facility, taken through a microscope. And we want you to guess what you think this is. So here's our picture for today. Now, what do you think this could be? Maybe have a look at some of the patterns. What shapes do you recognize? What textures? And is it a bit familiar? 
We'll find out what it is right after this break. I'm Helen and I'm Kerry and we run the Little London Herbal Stores and we're here to give you our five top winter health tips. My top tip for looking after my skin during the winter is to use the Willida Skin Food. I like to use this on my elbows, on my hands when they're chapped and also for flip-flop season in the summer when you get the hard skin on your heels. It's a really really thick cream that goes in lovely. It's not for everyday use, but for everyday, we've got the Skin Food Body Lotion, which you can use all over after your shower, and the Skin Food Light, which goes under your makeup. My next top tip is to take the Immune Boost Tablet by Nature's Plus. It's a one a day tablet that contains your vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin C and mushrooms to help keep your immune system healthy and keep away colds and flus. And did you know that some mushrooms are really good for helping increase your immune system and also helping with respiratory issues? So this is my favourite top tip and this is Echinacea in a hot drink. Echinacea is really good for boosting the immune system and fighting coughs and colds. All you need to do is pop a teaspoon of the liquid in a cup, pour on boiling water and you've got a really soothing, comforting drink that's going to have a lot of health benefits. Another of my top health tips is to take vitamin D liquid. Vitamin D is important all year round, but especially during the winter months as we don't get it from the sunshine. I like the liquid version better because it seems to be easier absorbed and it also tastes quite nice and it's a bit different from taking a tablet every day. So this is my top tip for sore throats. This is really, really good if you've got a sore throat. You just rip the top off and drink the contents and it coats your throat, it coats the mucous membranes. It's, it's not horrible like a lot of preparations that you use. It's quite um, lemony, minty sort of thing, but it really takes away the sore throat quickly. You know what really irritates me? Ordinary pads and tampons full of plastic and chemicals. You know what doesn't irritate me? Organic pads, tampons and liners. O-R-G-A-N-Y-C. They're clinically proven to protect my sensitive skin with 100% certified organic cotton. And they provide unsurpassed absorbency too. Organic. O-R-G-A-N-Y-C. The only clinically proven feminine care brand. Hmm, what a comforting thought. Hi, I'm John, owner at Gold Bank Jewelers in Nottingham's Victoria Centre Market. Here at Gold Bank, we basically buy and sell gold. Gold Bank is a buyer of any precious metal. When you sell your jewellery, you want to be doing it face to face and being able to ask any questions that you may have about the jewellery that you're selling. What I love about what we do is our customers being blown away with the prices they receive for bits of jewellery that have stayed in their jewellery box usually for 30 or 40 years. The value is incredible often. Welcome back to The Curiosity Show, the show that widens your knowledge of the world around you. Now, before the break, we were looking at a picture that some scientists in Nottingham have been looking at this week. Here it is again. Now, did you guess what it was at home? This is actually an image of a funny face that's been made out of fruit and household items. I feel like some of you maybe managed to see the smiley face, but did you know what it was made out of? Did you know that many foods glow with colour called fluorescent light and when ultraviolet light is shone onto them, these colours can be captured with a camera. 
So in this picture, we can see we've got the kiwi fruits for eyes. We've got a nose made out of an orange segment. And we've also got some eggshells, marmite and Vaseline. Thank you so much to the imaging team for all of their amazing photos through this week. We're learning so much here, aren't we? And speaking of learning, I think it's time to go back to our curiosity board for the final time. I can't believe it, but look at everything that we've learned throughout all of our shows. So on Monday, we met Titus, the T-Rex, where we found out that they've got eyeballs the size of a grapefruit, so their eyesight is absolutely amazing. And on Tuesday, we had our guests um, from Positively Empowered Kids, and they told us about all of the work they'd been doing with the pupils from Killisick Junior School, where they'd been learning about how the different parts of their brain works and how they control behaviour. Can you remember, Lara, you had a go at that balloon activity that made you feel like you were releasing all of your stress? <laughs> And we also, on Wednesday, went as one of our sustainable chemistry videos to find out what chemical reactions happen in cars. And if you remember, the people at the University of Nottingham are trying to make cars electric and are really working with the chemical reactions that are taking place there to make it more sustainable and better for the planet. Yeah, we've really learned so much from them about how science can be used to improve our environment. On Thursday, Rick was teaching us how to make squeaky noises from grass and we also headed over to the spider lab at the University of Nottingham where they were um, researching spider silk. I think one of my favourite things from Thursday was actually meeting Missy the Penguin. I really enjoyed that. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's definitely true. And then today we've had the electric car from um, the University of Nottingham racing team. Do you want to pop that in the corner down there just to make it nice and satisfying? Also, we saw um, Rick's demonstration earlier. We've enjoyed all of Rick's demonstrations, haven't we? Yeah. What's your favourite? Um, I like the eggs one, that was the most surprising one for me, I think. I think the bouncing balls, his excitement when that third ball went off and he was <laughs> like, wow! And we're also going to have a look at some ants through Sarah's videos. Have a look. Another amazing video and I think we've all learnt so much 
from Sarah's expansive knowledge about urban nature throughout the week. So that's a huge thank you to Sarah. And over the weekend, why don't you get outside and see if you can spot any of the amazing creatures that we've seen in Sarah's videos throughout the week. Can you remember what they are? We're looking for bees, wasps, wagtails, and now ants. We did challenge you to see five different types of birds earlier on in the week as well. So how far through that are you? Well, we're coming towards the end of the show now today. It has gone so quickly, but we've got a really special video now from Carly who talks about her hearing loss. Take a look. Hi, I'm Carly. I have profound single-sided deafness in my left ear. This means that my left ear I can't hear anything out of, but my right ear is working okay. Only being able to hear out of one ear means that everything sounds like it's coming from my hearing side. So if I'm looking for my mobile phone and I can hear it's ringing, but I have no idea where the ring is coming from, so it can take a long time to find it. Another challenge that comes with my hearing loss is the difficulty hearing when there's lots of noise. So, for example, if I'm in a restaurant and there's lots of people talking or music, then it can be really difficult for me to filter out the sounds to actually hear the person that I'm speaking to. So this can make socialising a little bit difficult sometimes. I also use my experience of hearing loss to guide hearing researchers to help ensure their research is relevant to people like me. So tell me, Benji, what do you like about taking part in hearing research? Well, I think it's very important actually because hearing is really important and you should always and you should always take advantage of that. I mean you can do fun experiments like like children it should be children should get into it. Since losing the hearing in my left ear I've become a passionate hearing health advocate. I write a blog called My Hearing Loss Story and I support people in my Facebook support group. More recently I've been training to become a life coach and I intend to use the skills and techniques learnt in this course to help people with hearing health issues to move forward with their lives and to achieve their goals. Thanks Carly and Benji and it's so cool that doctors and scientists want patients to be involved in research to look after others going through the same thing. Now as you can see we've got Johnny and Mike back from Box Lab to do another demonstration to close our final show so it's got to be a big one. I don't know what's going to happen or what they're going to do so guys what have you got to show us? So have you heard of something called hydrogen peroxide? I probably at some point. <laughs> During so, my schooling so days. So this, this is the stuff that people use to like bleach their hair or whiten their teeth. Yes. Um, but that hydrogen peroxide is a really low percentage. What we've got here, we've got about 30% hydrogen peroxide. It's a really strong oxidizer. And what mm -hmm. we're going to do is we're going to break down that hydrogen peroxide into oxygen and water. But to do that, you need a catalyst because okay. catalysts speed up reactions. They make them happen. We uh, learned about catalysts earlier, earlier in the week. week. Yeah, we ah, did. Yeah. Sustainable we chemistry. There we go. So um, <laughs> chemical reactions can be speeded up by a catalyst. So what we're going to do is we're going to speed up the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. Okay. So is this a good moment, moment for goggles on? Oh, yes. goggles on. OK, <laughs> sorry. So here's your there catalyst. OK. Uh, here's your Thank catalyst. You. 
What is it? Oh, so this catalyst is called manganese dioxide. Oh, so it's it's the Inside. metal underneath. It's yes. not the, the kitchen That's roll. No, no, no. Right. Okay. You've got it wrapped in it. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, kitchen roll. No kitchen roll with a catalyst. <laughs> right. <laughs> so on the count of three, what we're going to do is we're going to drop the catalyst in and we're just going to take a step back. Okay, so we're yeah? not going to shake it or anything. We're not going to shake it, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right, Ready. Three, two, one, go. Oh. You shook it. You told <laughs> me not to shake it. Wow. What's it's bubbling in there? Well. Well. Is that what happens in volcanoes? It's amazing. There we go. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. So what's happening there, guys? So the hydrogen peroxide is breaking down and it's turning into oxygen and water. So that's what we can see here. Oh, it smells. This ah. is just a mixture of the oxygen and water. Tell them about the temperature, mics. Oh, so Ooh. Once, Ooh, it's well, once it's finished, Ooh. just give the bottle a bit of a, a it's tap It's a bit the chilly in here, actually. So that's so quite nice. It's very warm. There we go. Ooh. And we call that an exothermic reaction. Yeah. It gives out heat. And you can see So that that's like waste energy that's being... Well, it's it, heat or no? Well, what, what this is, is it's um, when the bonds are being made right. in the product, it's mm -hmm. releasing a lot of energy and that energy is being released as heat. Nice. Yes. Have we got another one? Oh, so yes, we have another one. And this one is still about catalyst. So we just take our bottles, put them down. I don't think I'll be drinking. From that <laughs> so what oh. we've got here is, as you can see, we've got a lot more hydrogen peroxide. So this okay. is the same as what we had in the other one? So this is the same liquid as we had in the bottles, okay. but we've got about 10 times more. And we call this elephant's toothpaste. Right, well, um, I'm excited, so let's get on with this. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is, if you want to, first of all, put the washing up liquid, just put a squirt of washing up liquid in each one for us. Good little squirt, that's all right. Okay, that's sorry, it. I was a bit I'll, just for it. I'll just give that a shake, perfect, that's it, nice. Oh, you've give got it a more shake. yours. Right, what we need to do is add some food colouring as well. To this? Yeah, no, 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 to your, to your large oh, I've green. That's it. Just add all of it, all of it in. That's Come it. On. Let's just give it a shake. Let's now, go, again, let's go. we're using a catalyst to break down the hydrogen peroxide. We're going to trap all that oxygen in the washing machine. Hold on, hold on, wait, wait. This one's easy to go. Go on, then go on, yeah. Okay. Three, Three, two, two one. one. Oh, yours went quicker than mine. Oh, my gosh. So, oh. do you see why it's the <laughs> toothpaste now? Oh, because they wash their teeth with that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, it looks like massive marshmallow. <laughs> I actually love that. That's amazing, but it's the end of the show, Laura. I know. I can't believe that's the end of the Curiosity Show already. We want to say a huge thank you to, to the team here at Nonsuch, Joe and Lewis from Max Production, and Ewan from NTU for handling all of the tech and production. Also the team at Not CV for helping us to beam into your home. Students at Confetti to all of our music and graphics and everybody else who's helped us along the way. As always, don't forget if you enjoyed anything on the show and want to get involved with the festival, head over to our website www.notsfosac.co.uk. Thanks for joining us. We hope you learnt so much and we'll see you very soon. Bye! Bye. because the rings are so cheap but the designs are amazing and I buy two or three at a time because you can afford it. They're absolutely stunning. 